Um, so in addition to um, Janet and Robert, we also have some other folks here. So I think we'll just move down the line here. So first we have uh, Steve Pavlovsky from uh, GE Intelligent Platforms. You wanna just say a quick word? Yeah, hi folks, um, I'm Steve Pavlovsky. I'm responsible for a solution that GE uh, produces that enables OEMs like, uh, like Bob's uh, Business Pico um, to collect data off of their fleets of assets that they've sold to customers. Uh, so that they can deliver better service to those customers, um, and so you know we do that through, through you know leveraging, really delivering the power of the industrial internet to OEMs for service enablement. Okay, thank you. And uh, right on the other side of Janet, we have uh, Randy Amarine from AT&T. Thank you. Hello, my name is Randy Amarine. Maybe you could use the mic. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, my role in AT&T is I work with enterprise type companies with global operations, multiple divisions, that type of thing, that are working on product strategies that incorporate IoT type solutions. Uh, we work with them from the standpoint of actually looking at their requirements and taking it all the way through to an end-to-end -end solution development process and then uh, basically help them implement those products around the world. Okay, and at the end? Yeah, hello, my name is Kevin Davenport. I'm with Cisco Systems, and uh, my role is essentially Cisco has been traditionally uh, structured this business around horizontal and service provider markets. So we've aligned our business now to uh, speak specifically to verticals uh, that we represent. I'm, I represent the manufacturing vertical, uh, where I work with our customers to uh, to get their care abouts around Internet of Things or Internet of Everything technologies, the way Cisco brands it. And uh, I bring those solutions into the factory and dry the factory to, to make sure that we get them on the roadmap and get them out to the customers. Okay. Uh, okay. And he's and, at us that he's yeah, I think we're uh, having a little trouble with that mic, so if you can just hold it closer when, we, when you answer. Can, in the can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there we go. Right. Thanks. All right, good. Um, so uh, let's see uh, if we have a mic for the audience to qu uh, questions. Um, and do we have any questions from the audience? We're, we're ready here. While we're getting that set up, we have a question right here in the front. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak up. Uh, Jan, I, I was curious about your, your waste station. Right? There's, there would have been two ways to do it, right? You, you could have had a manufacturing execution system that, that knew what was supposed to come down the line, knew what it was supposed to weigh. And instead, the way I understand it, you have an RFID tag that says, this is how much I'm so why the RFID tag instead of doing the manufacturing system? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, um, Sorry, could you oh. just pull the mic up a oh. little? Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, we do have a manufacturing execution at factory, and, um, and it did know what it's supposed to weigh. And so really, all the RFID tag was doing was sending whether it weighed what it was supposed to weigh or not, and the rate at which product was going across the scale. And so... Um, it was doing that comparison in the background because it, it weighed it and then said, am I weighing what I'm supposed to weigh? And the only thing that went across the RFID tag was, yes, you weighed what you're supposed to or no, you didn't. And that was the real-time feedback that we, we got off the scale. Um, and so it was compared to our, our MES system. Okay, thank you. Now, if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll bring the, uh, the mic over. Scott, right on the other side. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Is this the, Perfect. Um, Mike, I have two questions actually, um, but they're they're very much related. That uh, that Kaiser um, example that you were giving about the compressors, I'm. In that specific example, I think, and, and I think it's the example I'm thinking of, one of the side benefits was also because Kaiser was actually uh, controlling the compressors, is they were also, the company was realizing um, energy savings because they were able to balance the loads uh, more effectively than they would have if they were controlling them at the um, facility. So I'm wondering, are there other examples of uh, side benefits that come with, uh, you know, this, I mean, th this whole concept of the OEM selling production rather than selling 
uh, capital, capital equipment. Are there other side benefits to that um, in addition to lowering the risk? And then also, Steve, maybe you can even talk about what are some of those examples that, you know, we're talking about the Internet of Things and it's coming and it's big and, but it's already here in a lot of instances. And, and what are some of those examples that maybe any of you can even uh, talk about what, what's already here and, and what's working? So well, Steve, respond on well, um, I don't really have any specific information about that that part of the question. So, but I think maybe yeah. We can so, see what as the panel you know, says. as we work with OEMs of basically any type of industrial equipment, there can be a variety of sort of direct and indirect benefits. Um, one of our customers is in the um, in the grain handling industry, so the deal with the, um, the the movement of grain from silos to trucks or from or from silo to silo. And at the same time, what they've started to do is monitor the temperature and humidity of the grain in those bins. And so not only are they um, monitoring the health of the systems and, and, and reacting when the systems for moving the grain have a problem to keep that Archer Daniels Midland or Riceland Foods operation working, uh, they've actually turned themselves into a, uh, a seller of the data with respect to the health of, of the grain. Because uh, it's fascinating as you, you work in these industries, you learn all kinds of different things. But you know, the the moisture content of grain is effectively um, equals money because they're they sell that grain based on weight, so they want to maintain it at an optimum uh, level of moisture, but also have to watch temperature for rodent or uh, sprouting or insect uh, activity. So by monitoring. Uh, the health of the grain at the same time they're monitoring the uh, the actual equipment that's moving it and controlling it you know uh, they've they've generated a whole new revenue stream for themselves uh, selling that data back to their uh, their own the actual owners of the grain so that's just that's just one example um, another customer that we're working with today um, is in uh, another customer in the electrical industry where they build tractor trailers full of battery cells for uh, grid stabilization. And the actual battery manufacturers value the data that they're starting to collect on, on, on the performance of the battery cells over time because it's a new application. The battery manufacturers don't really understand how their battery cells are gonna work over time. So yes, it's important for them to monitor the health of the battery cells and the recharge circuits uh, recharge time so that they know that their asset that they've sold to utility is going to work over its warranty period but they're actually now have data that's valuable back to the manufacturer of the effectively of the raw material um, so there's you know what we find is if you can find a second or third use for that data there's actually a giant profit pool um, because it's uh, you know it's it's free value uh, that that they're able to collect Okay, any other comments from the panel on uh, unanticipated benefits? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I can, I can offer a, a pretty interesting perspective. It's kind of like my individual perspective, but you know, Cisco is, you know, 14.9 trillion, 50 billion devices. If I hear that one more time, I'm just gonna, you know, a lot of people now are saying, well, what are we doing? What's the use cases? And so from my perspective, one of the single biggest drivers is actually psychological. We're, we're, we're evolving into a psychological paradigm that I think we're unaware of. And this paradigm actually has caused much consternation in my home. And it is Google Express delivery. My wife orders shoes, personalized toilet paper and paper towels all the way the whole gamut. And so what does that mean to us as manufacturers and consumers? So there's a transition going on. We usually talk about B2B and B2C, but we have another paradigm shift that's going is B2Me. So we expect products at a rapid rate, right? We next day shipments, uh, even product customizations. And you say, okay, man, I, I don't have a consumer business but that translates in, 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 in the way in what we expect in terms of delivery, in terms of how products are being produced, is very different. And one of the challenges for, for our industry is we still have a lot of siloed business processes in our, in our, in our operation, in our enterprise. So we, for example, we've built out over the last 10 or 15 years billions or invested billions of dollars in these enterprise systems, MES, SCADA, ERP, and the like. But you know our production systems sometimes aren't connected in a way that's efficient. But more importantly, we're connecting to the customers differently. 
right? That's really driving through that supply chain. So we have a very large uh, beverage manufacturer, right? And they deliver traditionally, uh, you know, soda products, water products, and whatever. But the new business model came from the marketing department dealing with customers differently, and they wanted a solution that was more customized. And so they developed a patch that connects wirelessly to their cell phone. And you guys, you guys ever had a soda, soda stream machine, you know, that you can actually purchase? So what they did now is they're deploying the soda machine to where you do a patch, put it on your arm, and do pre and post workout, for example, right? And it'll measure the electrolytes and everything that's going through. And then it'll deliver that soda stream based on your condition. Now, what does that mean? Now, the way they produce and the supply chain, so now they had a certain amount of, for instance, syrup that went through their, their machines and their production machines in their plant. Well, now, based on this, they have an order of magnitude, different combinations and permutations of, of, of a product that they have to deliver. So they have to clean their machines on a more regular basis, maintenance processes. So now the R&D department has to figure out a way to accommodate these changes in the manufacturing plant. So just that small change in the market in terms of they can obtain a huge amount of revenue, but that reverberates across their entire supply chain from R&D to operations to supply chain through customer acquisitions and stuff. So the way we're wired in terms of the, the way we consume and deliver products is changing profoundly and it's affecting our whole industry in ways where we have, definitely have to integrate and tightly integrate our whole supply chain. Okay, very good. Um, so I've got a question for you, uh, Randy. Um, some of the examples I have, particularly the mining example, um, you know, these are in very remote locations, and it's fine to have some sensors on some uh, some equipment. But how do you, you know how do you manage that? So I know you guys have some solutions mm -hmm. that, that that maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. And you please know, pull the mic close. Thanks. Sure. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, one of the things we run into is these solutions start to expand. You know, there's kind of the low-hanging fruit where you have uh, environments where connectivity is very good from a carrier perspective, and you're able to, you know, build out a solution with, with great connectivity and, and response and latency and so on. But then what happens is you start to get into some of the more diverse kinds of use cases, like a mining use case or uh, monitoring containers on ships as they're on the ocean and then managing that as they move from ocean to land. Uh, but what we've done is we've identified how to create hybrid connectivity solutions that utilize cellular, that utilize satellite, that combine those where necessary. And so as you're working with you know, your various providers of services, if you start to run into issues with remote connectivity that starts to hinder your strategy, for lack of a better term, around your particular IOT solution, there's a lot of different things that have been done, particularly in the last few years, and the economics of those have changed quite a bit. So uh, don't be intimidated by coverage issues that you may run into, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, you know, the, the mining application is one, the container one I'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, we have an application where we've got 250,000 plus containers that originate from ports all over the world. And we use multiple modes of communication on those. Uh, they include RGSM network or uh, backhaul over satellite. And that's all ubiquitous to the customer. Uh, the software that was developed, the platform that manages it, the devices that they run on, uh, the sensors that are in the various containers that manage uh, condition monitoring and create those reports. So that essentially what you end up with is a global view into chain of custody, supply chain logistics, whatever it may be. And the same thing applies to, to the mining applications and so on. There are just a lot of alternatives out there and they continue to emerge and change because this is one of the fastest moving technical trends that we've seen. And so I encourage you to work with you know, the suppliers and consultants and so on and your own internal teams to really understand if you've got a product strategy, you know, what is the current technology because it's changing so fast. Okay. Great. Uh, do we have any questions? Scott, we've got one, of course, on the other side of the room. <laughs> uh, 
my, my name is Prabhu. Um, I want to ask a question to the panel on the ecosystem. So if I go back to the late 90s, the reason the World Wide Web was successful is it really provided an ecosystem for players to create more value on top of the technology, right when the internet came out. Same thing happened again. It connected about a billion people. And when, when, they, when, when Steve Jobs released the iPhone, it, it created an ecosystem of app developers who were able to build on top of that ecosystem to have different applications that you see today, right? In the industrial sector, uh, most manufacturers and users are still siloed between product services and, and features and benefits. As you look through your business uh, of tying IoT into a P&L metric, uh, what kind of ecosystem needs to change, if any, to enable the rapid proliferation of technology adoption? Do you have any perspectives on your particular industry uh, of, of developing a common ecosystem uh, to, to get this going? I'll just take a quick shot at that just real briefly. I know one of the things that we identified is that that ecosystem is changing rapidly as well. And as a customer's requirements become identified, then that might create an entirely different approach to the ecosystem. One of the things that we've tried to do is create an innovation environment. Uh, and I see a lot of other industrial companies doing this, where they're creating, for example, centers of excellence for IoT that are embedded inside of their operation. They don't necessarily have a P&L responsibility. But business units inside those organizations can come inside that environment or some of their suppliers that have environments like that and do rapid prototyping that significantly uh, speeds up the time to deployment. And while they're in that innovation environment, that's where those various ecosystem partners can be brought in in a very innovation, collaboration-oriented environment uh, to accelerate both prototyping and understanding of what kind of an ecosystem is really needed for that particular product in general. Yeah, so, oh. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to add to that a little bit. The, I, I would actually argue whether it's a, a chicken and egg type question, really. Does the ecosystem exist first or does the, um, the, the ecosystem get developed around the adoption of technology? And so one thing that we found at Stanley Black & Decker was that we, if, if we just stuck our toe in and we said, okay, we're not going to worry about having the perfect ecosystem. We're just going to do what we can do as simply as we can do it then the thing takes on a life of its own and expands from there. And I really think, you know, based on what I'm seeing in the marketplace with regard to this whole Internet of Things, I, it feels to me like the World Wide Web, you know, frenzy that happened where, um, you know, it started out with a few people dipping their foot in, and once they get it in, they say, whoa, look what I just did. And then now everybody wants it, and it's kind of like what we're dealing with at Stanley. We're now all the, we got us expanded across all 40 lines. We've got expanded across all seven plants for power tools. We've got to expand it into the other plants. And that's just our internal customers. And so um, it, it really, it, it feeds on itself. And b the ecosystem then grows up around because of the demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would add uh, a, different, a different take on that, which is if you think about the problems um, that many of the industrial end users face today. Bob had it in his slides um, at the bottom, didn't really talk about it, which was you know, the, the exiting of the baby boomers out of the workforce, um, meaning there's a, there's a brain drain going on in the industrial base. Now, who's got to fill that, right? In, in, in a lot of the industrial cases, the end users are now looking to the OEMs to, to enable their production by providing service to those, uh, to those assets. Um, and the only way that that can happen cost effectively is through the use of data, uh, data collection techniques and analytics so that the OEMs know when there is likely to be a problem. Um, and, you know, so that's from a, a sort of a vertical perspective in terms of the OEM servicing that customer. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then in the slides, we, you, know, you, saw, you saw some discussion about horizontal up through the supply chain. Right? That's another variation on, you know, on, the, on the benefits of... Uh, and, and how ecosystems are going to are going to impact you know that end that end pro, uh, that end product and production um, by you know delivering you know taking data from upstream in the supply chain feeding it all the way down through so that you know the end users uh, you know producing what you know what they expected because of the, the quality or the amount of the raw material showing up at the right time so that's all going to require some level of standardization. 
uh, in terms of interfaces or at least the multitude of interfaces that, that people have to work through to, to sort of make those linkages. Um, and that's, that's actually one of the big challenges that I think uh, hmm. uh, we face over the next few years is, is the plethora of, of, of methods for interconnecting these systems. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would chime in and, and say the same thing, just to piggyback on that. <clears throat> We're putting a lot of energy around standardization. So we have initiatives with our partner where we're positioning very familiar and building on the standards that are very familiar that built the World Wide Web. So standard IP-based technologies. If we don't have that ecosystem of technologies and standardization, that's gonna be the biggest barrier to IoT value. So uh, again, Cisco has strategically partnered um, with, our, with our partners to strategically develop this ecosystem. Uh, in order to, to proliferate that and make it happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, do we have another question? I have one for, uh, for you, Janet. Um, you know, I, I mentioned when I, when I came up that you, I, I like the fact that you said, uh, let's just try it. And that was a big part of, of the way you approached this. But, but it also strikes me that you, you took pains to mention that one of the factors was that you already had a wireless system, a pretty ro robust wireless network involved, uh, installed. And um, so I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what that means for, for having that kind of infrastructure for other kinds of decisions like that in, in this plant and, and, and other plants going forward. Yeah, so, and it was a little bit by design because we chose the Renosa factory as one of our first places to test out the smart factory because we knew we had a, a strong infrastructure base there. So we had a bit of ecosystem already in place. But um, the thing we found since then is that uh, the benefits, which you know I shared, uh, are so profound that they pay for the wireless network enhancements that we might need to do in other factories, which we will need to do in our other factories. And so our plan to roll it out includes uh, rolling out the infrastructure to be able to support the system. And because we picked kind of a simple uh, first case that doesn't require a super dense wireless infrastructure, it, it opens things up a bit and means that we can invest in a little more uh, tiered basis. But we do have intentions to really uh, build out our wireless network in all of our factories to be able to support this as well as a bunch of other uh, sort of, you could say IoT, but connected factory kinds of um, applications that we intend to leverage off that backbone. And so that's just part of the um, infrastructure, I guess, but it's, uh, the, the system, it pays for itself, it turns out. I always like that answer. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, so we do have time for another question. Um, so let me um, throw out a question uh, that just for everyone on the, on the panel to respond to, and that's the uh, this cybersecurity question. We always have to consider it, and uh, uh, you know, how, what role did it does it play in in the systems that you've talked about? So maybe Bob. You've been quiet well, for a little while, so we'll start yeah. here. Um, we talked about that earlier uh, with ourselves and um, came to the conclusion that, that a lot of our clients really have systems that, um, let's say, maybe aren't so secure. But what we're doing in our application with our iStyle product and our Freedom Eye gear, it's all I, it has to do with our system, um, is we look at it as a uh, field agent pretty much is um, a data diode to where the information is being sent out. We're not sending back control information, so we really can't take a system down or modify a system for the client. Um, we're just gathering the information, analyzing the information, and selecting the right avenue of solution, be it just a callback or um, physical contact or what other type of dispatch we ought to do in our um, response, whether it's mechanical, electrical, it's grid related, it's dollar related. So security is just, um, it, and, and the ability to go through what we call the, our, our cloud, you know, our Pico cloud, our encrypted cloud, yeah, you know, security is always a problem, but it's usually a problem going the other way. 
Okay, thanks. Steve? Yeah, so, you know, to, to sort of tack on to what, what Bob has said, obviously if you're doing uh, data collection only, um, security could be considered less important, but there's still a value to that data. And so making sure that, especially if you're gonna traverse the public infrastructure, you know, everything being encrypted, both at the data collection layer across, the, and as it, as it traverses the public infrastructure is critical. Um, and then there's gotta be good user practices around, you know, who has access to the data and, uh, and for what purposes. So, you know, as, as the general was talking this morning, you know, it's not just, you know, <clears throat> someone in IT's responsibility to make sure that that data is secure. There's gotta be good robust um, practices and policies on top of a good uh, technical solution uh, that, that's gonna keep the, the data secure. Okay, uh, Janet. Yeah, so you know, Stanley Black & Decker, you know, being a company that's been in business for 170 years, we're a pretty uh, conservative organization from a security standpoint, especially from IT security. But at the same time, we're driving forward with this digital excellence platform. And so we um, know we have to you know, get out of our own way uh, as far as that goes. But at the same time, um, make sure that we're comfortable with the level of security of our information because it, you know, in many cases, it's, a, it's our production information um, that we're uh, you know, s sending off. In the particular implementation of Renosa, that was a self-contained within the Stanley network system. And so we didn't have to worry about it so much. We already had all of our protections in place. But we do have other deployments where we can see a benefit to having the system housed in the cloud because it makes it easier for some of the enterprises to connect that way. And so it's something that we're, we've, we've started down that path and we have uh, you know, some experience with it now. And so far the experience has been good, but it's definitely a, a serious consideration uh, that we're dealing with every day with our, uh, our, our other customers as well as our internal deployments. Okay, and then uh, Randy? Well, at at and as you can imagine, our network is one of the largest in the world, so we're continually uh, watching for threats of all different types. And uh, I actually sat in a meeting with our head of security a few months ago with IT business leaders from one of our larger uh, corporate accounts, and he showed a slide, and it showed kind of the history of cybersecurity over the last 10 or 15 years. And so he got to the end of the slide and it showed that the, the primary threat today is not from the guy down in the basement, you know, working on his PC anymore. It's nation state types of security, nation state types of threats. And so if you're in a business that uh, has, uh, like Pico is an example, where you're responsible for somebody's critical power sources, uh, there's a lot of regulatory work that's been done that I would encourage you to take a look at from a standard standpoint. Uh, on IoT specifically, uh, most of that type of connectivity, at least in the environments that we get involved in, you know, it's an encrypted uh, unit or device specific uh, VPN. And so there, what I'd encourage you to do is as you work with your suppliers and you ask that question about security, ensure that they can show you and demonstrate existing uh, environments where they have met the security requirements of multiple companies, whether that's a large enterprise, medium enterprise, or government managed or government regulated industry, uh, because there's different sets of requirements across each of those verticals. So it may vary for your business. You may have a bigger risk than others, but I'd encourage you as you work with the folks who support you to have them demonstrate very clearly how they approach security for IoT specifically as opposed to how they might do it for other aspects of the business that support yours. Okay, thank you very much. And Kevin, I'd just like to point out that we are at the end of our time, but yeah. given that, with that in mind. <laughs> I can, yes, yeah, so with that in mind, I think I can make mine pretty short. Uh, one of the key motivations for bridging that IT, OT gap that, that exists in some of our organizations and, um, is security. So at Cisco, we're taking a holistic approach uh, to being able to develop and present a validated architecture uh, that can be used to bridge that conversation because traditionally what happens is you have holes in one or the other just because there's no communication between both entities that, that are responsible for those portions of your network. So as you know, you start to have these conversations with your OT uh, stakeholders or your IT stakeholders, security should be top of mind and at least should be the catalyst for those discussions. 
Okay, well thank you all for staying with us this afternoon and please join me in thanking our speakers and panelists.